thing. So what we have here is a, an overview of ICRAG's energy transition research. Um, this is a selection of the presenters we're going to have. It's a very short period of time. We've got 55 minutes really to give you a whistle-stop tour of the research that we are engaged in. Um, just to give you some perspective, you know, based on the presentation that you would have seen from Jean, um, this is ICRAG 2's research pro uh, program till 2026. So we've got our systems change, earth resources and earth science and society. And obviously energy transition sits within that earth resources part, along with the raw materials. There are breakout sessions on each of these subjects and there will be a recording for, for people to get later on. So in terms of the energy transition uh, challenge that we are faced with as a country and as a, as a planet, you know, we have uh, ICRAG Research is here to support a series of these initiatives you've seen in the presentations um, at the beginning of this session. So Ireland's Cl Climate Action Plan, which is released, uh, a new version has been released um, during COP and we've got sector by sector ambitious targets and emissions reductions uh, targets to uh, adhere to. There's also the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which was established during COP26, where um, the Ireland and a number of other countries have formed an alliance to move away from hydrocarbons. The European Green Deal is uh, another one, and obviously COP26 commitments. You know, the, the objective really after COP26 is to keep 1.5 at reach. Um, and some of the objectives and deliverables for that are around accelerating the phase out of coal, the electric vehicle speed up and renewable investment. Um, another more global one, I suppose, uh, in, in conjunction with COP26 is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we feature very much there from our energy transition research with um, SDG 7 around the provision of affordable and clean energy, getting that energy trilemma uh, balance right, as Niall talked about during the panel session, and also the climate action um, in terms of decarbonisation. So these are very much on our um, objectives as, as we continue our research. I'm gonna hand you over now for a minute to Peter Houghton. He heads the Energy Transition Group and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the uh, previous projects. Okay, so Emer has just described the uh, societal and uh, policy backdrop. There is a, a technical backdrop here, which is the work we did in uh, uh, ICRAG one, so phase one, um, particularly in, in the energy, what was then the energy security spoke um, well, we had a whole bunch of projects shown here um, covering most of the, the Irish offshore uh, shelf area uh, and some global areas as well. Next slide. Um, so from, from this work on, on the offshore basins, uh, we're now sitting on a wealth of new information uh, from those basins. All, all the way from thinking about the um, sediment supply and, and the paleogeography of the basins through to the uh, structural development and the interplay between structure and uh, stratigraphic evolution. Uh, other projects in, in, in ICRAG-1 dealt with uh, improved subsurface imaging uh, and also how we characterize the subsurface and particularly geomodeling was, was an important uh, component of that. Now the, the work on the offshore basins that went on uh, was paralleled by, particularly under the uh, 3D Ireland platform work on onshore. Um, so we're coming now to, to you know, the second phase of ICRAG uh, and the energy transition, where we can take a, a lot of the experience we've had in the subsurface, um, the new tools we developed, the new understanding we've developed, and uh, repurpose those now for a whole series of issues that are coming at us in the subsurface as we move through the, the energy transition. So Ema is going to explain a little bit more about this and then the various technical talks we'll have will, will uh, uh, help to illustrate this a little bit more. So back to you, Ema. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So yeah, as we say, ICRAG2 is focused on energy transition research um, and only parts of that are we able to present really today. So just to give you kind of a more a broader flavor of, of what we're working with. So we have geo storage around energy storage, carbon capture and storage. Uh, information and, and work and research on rift basin architecture and structuration, seal integrity, various scales from geobody to pore scale characterization, uh, geomodeling, uh, which um, Tom is going to present uh, later on, and then carbon capture and uh, hydrogen storage, which Cara is going to talk about. As well as that, we have the renewable energy uh, sector 
side of things where we are working on uh, de-risking offshore wind energy, for example. So we've got work on forecasting, on resource assessment and geotechnical characterization. And just to let you know, we were planning on, uh, we had a, a whole conference uh, workshop day show, showcasing all of the work that ICRAG is doing on the offshore wind energy area that was supposed to happen last month. Unfortunately, it was postponed due to the pandemic. It's an in-person event and we're hoping to do that in uh in q1 of next year so watch the space for that we're also looking obviously at geothermal energy potential the 3d ireland project fracture and fault characterization subsurface imaging and flow modeling we've seen as well and we've spoken quite at length so far in this conference around the role of critical minerals and we do have uh, people working on developing and applying tools for raw material exploration to enable that energy transition it's one of the parallel um breakout sessions that's taken place and you will get a, a recording of that if you want to see. And then as has been brought up multiple times, I think so far during this conference, the idea of earth science in society and how we as geoscientists better translate the subsurface to society at large, to policymakers and, and, and the communities. So examining societal variability regarding the just transition and climate action and responsible uh, geoscience research and innovation. And we'll have a talk by Pat later on talking about that, that element too. So really just a very quick snapshot of ICRAG. You know, we're over 100 uh, researchers. We're across eight different institutions around Ireland. Uh, so you've got some images there of a selection of the researchers and the uh, PIs and FIs involved in ICRAG's energy transition research. We're a national resource funded in large part to help with Irish industries. We really want to listen to your problems, your challenges, and how we can actually help you solve those so we do work with a wide range of companies from small SMEs to large multinationals, and we can work on a one-to-one on -one basis with companies or in a consortia. So we do leverage uh, our SFI funding for various projects as well, which is advantageous, really. So very quickly, let's move on. We don't have a huge amount of time. So what we want to do here is talk about subjects such as storage and geological reservoirs. So we'll have Dr. Cara English to cover that. We have a geothermal energy at ICRAG from um, Professor John Walt, and then we're going to look at bringing all that together by means of geomodeling research um, by Tom and Lucky. And then finally, we have a session, as I said, from the social science front on public imaginaries of earth resources and how ICRAG can respond. So I will pass you on now to Cara. So share my screen. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay. All right. My name is Cara English. I'm an assistant professor with the UCD School of Earth Science. Today I'll be talking to you about the geostorage potential in Ireland for the energy transition. So in UCD, in collaboration with iCraig, we started a new group called the Sustainable Energy Research Group. This is where we bring together multidisciplinary expertise within one umbrella, which is an example of convergent research within iCraig 2. So currently we're working on an initiative which is called Get Set. And this is reflecting that we need to get ready for the energy transition. And as well, this needs to be an integration of different disciplines, including science, engineering, and technology. The Get Set project looks at geostorage applications. And so geostorage can be useful because, for example, this can help us to achieve our, our, our net zero targets for the Paris Agreement, and this involves injecting carbon dioxide into the subsurface, um, such as the application of CCS. In addition, geoenergy storage can help to balance the intermittent energy resource, and such as the emergence of the wind energy resources, renewable energy. And this can involve the injection of hydrogen into the subsurface, but there's also alternative energy storage solutions such as compressed air energy storage and aqu aquifer thermal energy storage, which John Walsh will talk about later. So there's a number of overlaps with the different types of applications and workflows for evaluating geostorage energy, geostorage um, applications, but today I'll be talking about CCS, carbon capture and storage. So what is carbon capture and storage? So this involves the capture of CO2, which is typically emitted from a point source, whether this is a power plant or an industrial process such as cement. 
It's transported then to an underground storage site where it's then stored in a geological formation. And this can consist of a depleted gas field or saline aquifers, which are then not connected to our drinking water supplies. So why, why should CCS be considered in Ireland? Well, for example, in the IPCC, there's the modeling that they have done includes CCS as a means to reduce the amount of emissions in order to achieve our targets for 1.5 degrees. In addition, there's significant developments that are occurring across Europe and policy policies are supporting the use of CCS as well, such as the European Green Deal. There's also significant funding that's putting into developing this technology and implementing it in the various member countries. In Ireland, CCS could be used in conjunction with gas-powered electricity, electricity generation. And this is where the emissions of such generation can be captured and then stored in the subsurface. And this is particularly relevant because on Tuesday, the government had announced that between four and seven new gas-powered electric electricity power plants would be built in the next decade. And so this would provide us with a reliable low emissions electricity source. Additionally, I, CCS can be, um, can be used to decarbonize heavy industries such as cement, but it can also help to deliver negative emissions. So for example, the use of CCS with bioenergy, which is a grown fuel that's carbon neutral, if we capture the emissions from bioenergy and then store them, this would give us means to offset some of the more diffuse emissions such as transport and agriculture. And finally, the use of CCS could be also used to facilitate the production of low carbon blue hydrogen, where CO2 is, is a byproduct of the conversion of methane to hydrogen through thermal reforming. So in addition to support across Europe, there's a growing support for CCS in Ireland as well. A number of organizations have described the importance of CCS in power and heavy industry, but also the environment. And in response to this, the Climate Action Plan 2021 outlines that CCS retrofit of two out of four cement plants will be evaluated in, in the next cycle. And as well, a policy framework and roadmap will be developed for CCS. There's a number of point sources where CCS could be captured and some of them are included here on this map. You see that most of them are from electricity generation, but also heavy industries such as cement and aluminum. It also likes to highlight the location of our offshore gas fields, including the Kinsale Head gas fields, Seven Heads and the Corp gas fields. So these are points where, where gas has been stored in the subsurface for millions of years, so essentially are proven storage containers. Ireland's a large number of sedimentary basins, and a lot of these have data, a lot of data from wells and, and seismic acquisition. And ICRAG-1, in, co with, in collaboration with industry, has contributed to the understanding of these basins, as Peter had highlighted earlier. So previous studies have evaluated that there is significant potential of CO2 storage across the Irish offshore. And this includes up to 93 gigatons of CO2 in depleted gas fields, as well as the saline aquifers. More recent work has looked at the Kinsale head field, gas field, as well as the Corb field, and this highlights the significant storage capacity that um, could potentially be available. And additionally, there's additional storage energy potential that we can see beneath the Irish Sea, and this would be in proximity to Dublin, uh, which could be a centre where we could also harness the CO2. So going forward in, I, in ICRAG 2, the Sustainable Geoenergy Group and ICRAG are undertaking an initiative to characterize Ireland's geostorage potential. So this project is threefold and involves different expertise across three different main strands. So the capacity aspect addresses how much storage is available, um, moving this from a theoretical capacity into something that we can see as an economic prospect. Next would be injectivity. And this is more on the reservoir engineering site and modeling how much CO2 we can actually inject in these sites. And thirdly, seal integrity deals with the containment issue. So characterizing these sites would involve a detailed analysis that would form the basis of the resource and the risk assessment of each. So these three streams are concurrent. So we can see that we have our, our capacity assessment, and this would include the structural and stratigraphic analysis of the storage complex. So not just the reservoir itself, but also the overburden, the underburden, and looking at the lateral distribution. So look at the reservoir characteristics, 
characterization, porosity, permeability, as well as the regional hydrodynamics. The reservoir engineering would then look at the dynamic modeling of these sites or these fields, and we'd be particularly interested in what's the injectivity at the wells and where the wells should be placed, as well as what the behavior of the CO2 will be and what the ultimate fate of the CO2 once it's into the system. And then the seal integrity can, looks at the containment. So what are the, what are the different risks that we have looking at the fractures and the, the fault movement? And if we do inject a new fluid into the subsurface, what's the chances of the fault reactivation? So this, this type of work um, would look at the overall seal capacity of the system. In iCRAIG2, there's currently a number of funded projects that are ongoing. Um, these involve scoping projects as well as more process-driven projects that will also apply to CO2 applications. So the Sustainable Geoenergy Group and UCD in association with iCRAIG and in partnership with other um, institutions such as the University of Edinburgh, as well as the UCD School of Economics, we're putting together a proposal called the Get Set Project. And this is where we're looking to characterize the geostorage applications in Ireland. And we're hoping to move these sites forward so that we could help with, uh, help inform with investment decisions as well as policy. So currently we're in the scoping phase of this project and we welcome any comments or feedback and uh, please get in touch. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Cara. Yeah, I think I uh, forgot to say, post any questions that you have in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we're going to move now on to John Walsh's presentation on geothermal. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about research uh, on ge deep geothermal systems, which is performed by ICRAG researchers. And these projects are actually performed, uh, are funded both by uh, ICRAG and by lots of other funding agencies. Um, this is the backdrop, the energy use in Ireland, 38% of energy is heat related and 92% of that comes from fossil fuels. So there's clearly a, a demand and a problem. And uh, uh, the notion is that, of course, the subsurface can both provide a potential heat source as well as a, a store. And so uh, the source might be uh, just natural geothermal energy. It might also potentially be uh, wa warmed or heated uh, water arising from curtailed or excess sort of wind energy. It could even be hot water from data centers, for example. Um, and then you would store them either seasonally, so the large time scale, or even on a short term basis to the point where you're nearly talking about a, uh, you're nearly talking about a geothermal battery. And here's geothermal energy systems as they're generally sort of seen to exist. This here is a, a uh, a doublet system uh, on the upper right hand side and you've got it's open loop so you're actually sort of flushing in water and you're extracting it warm because of the a geothermal gradient or we can have closed systems here and this is a closed loop the thing about this graphic is it's illustrating the generation of electricity but that's not really going to be an issue in ireland just because the systems are so uh, low enthalpy. So effectively, we're going to be talking about heat rather than electricity. And district heating systems is uh, most the most likely use uh, insofar as it's directly addressing the problem of heat. And um, the rocks we have to contend with are varied. They vary from fractured and karst related limestones, which have their own challenges, uh, through to um, Onshore and up in the north, we've got sandstone clastics, which for a variety of reasons may actually uh, be uh, even simpler systems uh, than the quite complex fractured karst limestones. We can go for single well systems. We saw the doublet here on the right. They can be single well, but they can be uh, open or closed loop. So they can draw water up or they can uh, conduct heat from the, um, uh, through the system. We can produce heat or we can store heat. So that's a general sort of technical backdrop. And I, I'm going to go through a number of uh, sort of projects which are pertinent in this context. I'm going to way back before uh, it, this project finished just as ICRAG was beginning, the IRATHERM project, and it did some excellent work. It defined sort of strategic and holistic sort of understanding of Ireland's geothermal energy potential using a variety of tools, geophysical, geological. And you can sort of see that we were in 2004, we were looking at uh, model temperatures at two and a half kilometers on in 
on the left. And for 2020, we know it looks like this on the right hand side, which is, uh, you know, temperatures of about 60 degrees or perhaps even more, particularly in the north, uh, when we're dealing with about two and a half kilometers depth. And of course, the rocks, um, they, they have an effect. Their conductivity is an effect on the source of water temperatures we get in limestones. We might get 50 to 60 degrees in basement rocks and particularly granites. We might get up to 65 to 75 degrees. So a really good and encouraging backdrop. There was other work in Iratherm, such as the work from uh, Sarah Blake and others uh, looking at uh, the geothermal warm springs in the deep Dublin basin. And you can see these orange colored dots and uh, the red color, these are warm springs, um, modest temperatures up to 25 degrees, but they show that what you've got is a proper sort of geothermal circulation system, which is, as it happens, structurally and karst controlled. And within the Dublin Basin, which is bounded here in the south in the Black Rock uh, Newcastle Fault, which is a couple of kilometers displacement, this hole here in Newcastle towards the west um, that had temperatures at about one and a half kilometers of about 46 degrees. So again, encouraging uh, news. This was developed on in a geo-urban project, which is Geothermica. And I should say all the funding bodies are given the upper right-hand corner of my slides uh, and the partners are in the boxes just underneath the title here. Um, so it looked at two different urban environments, Dublin and Valles in Spain combined geophysical data, it looked at the geothermal resources and generated conceptual flow models. And in the city centre, which is this box here shown, the area, this is the Holt Fault we think is particularly important here. It's transparent, it's dipping to the north here, and we think that you can drill down to about sort of one and a half, two kilometres, and you will actually intersect that fault, which uh, would you would anticipate generating, of course, uh, porosity and permeability and flow. That's also uh, com compounded by the fact that these green faults, which are alpine, so tertiary faults, they're north and northwesterly strike slip faults, uh, very small faults like that are actually known to be carrying fluids. And so the hot springs and uh, uh, the warm springs in Huntstown Quarry, it's only 16.3 degrees modest temperatures. But it's got about 7,000 cubic meters, and of course it's that surface. So the idea is that where we come to the intersections of these faults, the normal faults in red and the green faults, the alpine faults in green, and um, we know from mine data that that's exactly where we get accentuated karst development and accentuated uh, dilational strains. So we had a we performed a, a basic sort of feasibility study and suggested that you know th this thing has a, a has a chance. These sorts of uh, models and geothermal systems have. In uh, we have another project, the UCD Campus project, which is really just uh, started. And here's a 3D model from the geologic survey here, and we're showing here the uh, the. Uh, Blackrock Newcastle Fault and the Holt Fault, and we think there's a link between the two of those. And this project is going to investigate the contribution of geothermal to the on-campus uh, district heating system. And there are multiple sources of heating that they use, and we want geothermal to be one of them. Uh, favorable conditions, deep basin, fault bounded, and uh, we know from Newcastle, 47, 46 degrees here in the west, and at about one and a half kilometers deep. And because we think there is actually a link between uh, UCD and the uh, Black Rock Newcastle Fault and the Holt Fault, we think UCD is going to be in a prime spot for uh, high porosities and permeabilities, uh, just as the main bounding fault Newcastle was. So um, here's a map showing the faults. We've already acquired some data, passive seismic and uh, resistivity and gravity along those two, the purple line, which is the dark line, and the line within the UCD. We want to get uh, active seismic data along these sorts of lines, as well as uh, borehole data, of course. And in the long run, we hope by the time we get to the end of 2023, we'll get all of those sorts of data. Um, this is the sort of time scale and um, working towards the drilling of a, a geothermal well. Um, this is a project, hotline project. It, it's actually a geological survey project, but uh, uh, UCD, um, ICRAD UCD uh, contributed uh, 
one of the models uh, that underpins this study, which was looking at structural controls and decarbonates, the distribution, recoverability of geothermal resources. And, and the three study areas were Clare, Dublin and Loch Allen. And so UCD had uh, generated a 3D model, which with uh, the GSI, will it'll be made available to, to all. And it was investigating the fractured and faulted nature of those uh, uh, limestones. Um, there's another project, uh, which is sort of halfway through, which is the DIG project, the DIAS project. DIAS, you'll see, are involved in a lot of these projects. Uh, they're definitely big movers in this. And they're looking at the regional geothermal gradients using a variety of data and uh, geophysical and geochemical. And they're concentrating on the thermochemical crustal structure of uh, Munster Basin, which is radically different from much of the rest of Ireland. And also they're looking at the Mallow Warm Spring system. We also have a number of projects on geophysical monitoring and structural analysis of induced seismicity. These are some pictures here from Oklahoma, natural waste disposal, uh, and then a couple of natural systems where we're showing the earthquake locations and their scales and color coded for time. There's GS, the Coast Seismic Project just finished, which is a geothermica, again, led by DIAS. Um, there's a project which is a Marie Curie Global Fellowship started this year uh, with ourselves and UCD and the University of Alberta, who are experts in such things. And they've generated the pictures on the right hand side in glorious technical and 3D. And we're looking at the in, in, inducement, the development of these structures uh, associated with fluid flow in the system, which, of course, could be an issue in Ireland. And then the DEEP project is, follows on from Coast Seismic. Um, we've got a couple of proposals, of course. We've got a number of proposals. I'm just going to show you one, which is an SEAI proposal with our partners here. Again, DIAS, UCD Energy Institute, GDG, I should say. They're, they've done a lot of work in Ireland in uh, geothermal and then Causeway GT. And uh, it's looking at the mix of uh, different sorts of renewables uh, into the district heating system in UCD and also with geothermal resource uh, characterization as well as technology assessment. And then finally, the, another potential project, we, one we've actually submitted, is the notion of actually using excess uh, energy from wind and uh, using that sort of wind energy to, to to heat some warm water and then to actually store that in the subsurface for use in district heating systems, um, uh, uh, which are adjacent. And uh, that sort of project we're doing with Utah, who are probably uh, are probably world experts on, on, on this sort of area, certainly the prime in US. So um, I hope I've given you an idea of what we do. We do the full range of things in the multicolors. We got a variety of, uh, thank the support of uh, GSI, Geothermica, SEAI, and SFI, and uh, also our, our industry partners. Thanks. Thanks, John. I think we're going to move straight on now to uh, Tom Anzaki, who's going to say a little bit about uh, uh, geomodeling. And over to you, Tom. Thanks, Peter. I'm just getting my slides up. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I'm yeah, I'm Tom Manzocchi. I'm heading up the um, the iCrag geomodeling platform. So what I'm going to talk about here is I'm going to discuss two areas of um, geomodeling research that we've been working on in UCD for the last few years. And these are the, the compression algorithm and fault zone element modeling. So what I'll do, I'll describe the methods, I'll summarize where we are with them, and I'll finish by explaining a bit on where we want to go with them. So as you can tell, I suppose, from the logos on this slide, these methods originated in industry funded projects that aim to improve oil field reservoir and flow models. But the, the approaches are quite general. And, and one of the challenges we're faced at the moment, I suppose, is refocusing their application within the energy transition and for other industry sectors. So the compression algorithm is associated with FASHI's modeling. A FASHI's model is a top level subdivision of the geology into a small number of categories with different gross characteristics. And then these categories are then used to constrain later property modeling where continuous distributions like porosity and permeability are, are, are defined. So various algorithms exist for FASHI's modeling, and these range from simple variogram-based geostatistical methods to more complex methods that um, try to mimic depositional processes. And you know, often the, the methods are represented graphically on a plot like this one. And this illustrates the tension between methods that can honor hard data, specific well observations in other words, and methods that can generate geologically realistic models. 
I suppose we've realized really that this is quite a misleading representation. And if we replace what I think of as a quite wishy-washy, arm-wavy criterion of geological realism with something more objective, like the ability to reproduce and honor fascist connectivity, then this means there are actually two very distinct groups of fascist modeling approaches. There are those that are capable of honoring predefined fascist connectivity and those that are not. And unfortunately, the pixel-based methods, which are capable of honoring well data, are not capable of honoring fascist connectivity. So this is where the compression-based algorithm comes into it. You know, the compression algorithm really was designed to solve this problem. And what it does is it provides an extra degree of freedom to object-based modeling or pixel-based modeling, which allows the connectivity of these methods to be defined as input. So the compression algorithm is a two-step process. In the first step, a fascist model is built that contains the correct fascist connectivity, but with scaled fascist thicknesses and volumes. So for an object-based model like the one shown here, the connectivity can be quantified using the amalgamation ratio. An amalgamation ratio in, a, in an object model varies linearly as a function of the fascist volume fractions. So in the second step of the algorithm, the geometry of the grid is modified. This doesn't change the grid topology, so it doesn't change the connectivity, but it allows us to rescale the fascist volume fractions and thicknesses to whatever the target values are. So this results in a fascist model with user-defined connectivity, as well as user-defined thicknesses and volume fractions. So here's some simple examples. The first um, model here, number one, is a conventional object-based model. And in, in, in this model, then, the amalgamation ratios of both the yellow and the green fascies are unconstrained, and they're equal to their volume fractions. But the other three models have been built using the compression algorithm. They all have low connectivity of the yellow fascies. But in these examples, the green fascies is either random in number two, has a very, very low connectivity in number three, or a very high connectivity in number four. So these really represent, reflect, I suppose, different underlying conceptual models for, for the fascies. So recently, we've been focusing a lot on defining the maths of the, of the compression algorithm. So the input to the modeling are fascies volume fractions and thicknesses, and these are distributed in the particular hierarchical arrangement that, that we're interested in. And then the compression algorithm applies the compression factors, and it produces the model with the specific output model properties. So we've derived an analytical solution for calculating the output properties as a function of the modeling input. And we've used this analytical forward solution to solve the inverse problem numerically. So this lets us calculate then the modeling input values as a function of the user-defined target properties. A second aspect we've been, been thinking about is generalizing the method for pixel-based modeling. I've already explained why it's important to use pixel-based modeling rather than object-based modeling. And the reason is really that they can be constrained to well data. But if we do use pixel-based modeling, it means we need to use a different measure of connectivity because amalgamation ratio is really meaningless in a pixel-based model. So what we've done is we've established the percolation threshold of many common pixel-based geostatistical algorithms, which means that we can use the proximity of a system to its percolation threshold as a general measure of connectivity. So this means that we can generate models with different geostatistical algorithms, but the same gross characteristics. For example, the two models on the right have the same low volume fractions and the same high connectivity of the yellow permeable fascies, but have been generated with different approaches. And I, I suppose I've shown these models because they're designed to reproduce the characteristics of the fluid driven crack seal veins in, um, in these low permeability continental mudstones that are shown there at the, in the photo at the bottom. And I suppose basically I'm showing this because I want to demonstrate that the method can be used to model high connectivity as well as low connectivity geological systems. So in the initial phase of iCRAG, we coded the compression modeling workflow as a set of plugins in the Petrel software as we were developing the ideas. And these approaches, you know, we can then use them in conjunction with the, the vast array of geomodeling functionality that we've got in, got in Petrel. So Deirdre Walsh, who worked on many of the topics I've been discussing so far, is currently working with these plugins on a project that aims to demonstrate the power of the approach using the outcrops and associated research borehole data set from the, from the loop heads um, area of, of County Clare, West of Ireland. Okay, so the second topic I wanna to talk about is discrete fault zone element modeling. So the idea here is that if we have a subsurface model with faults in it, we know that the faults will actually be more continuous in the model than they are in nature. And that's because we just can't see the complexities on the faults because they're in the subsurface. But when we look at faults in outcrop, we'd see various types of lenses and relay zones on the faults. And the idea behind the fault zone modeling is to populate faults with realistic stochastic distributions of these elements. 
So we've collected a lot of data on, on fault zone elements over the years and have used these data to define a simple geometrical scheme that allows us to describe fault zone structure as a function of frequency, integrity, and shape of different elements of different sizes. So in this graph here, the red dots are representing, each dot represents the constants we've defined for many, many faults in, in different fault systems that we've looked at. So we've created software for generating models of segmented faults that are based on these constants. So these idealized n-member models shown in red there have been built using the parameterizations, the n-member parameterization shown by the blue dots. So I suppose these models show that there's a huge range in possible structure on a similar sized fault. And in some cases, like the models at the back of this, this diagram, the ones with a high frequency and late breaching, you know, the small scale fault zone elements are really dominating the fault zone structure. But in other cases, the low frequency early breaching cases at the front, the continual approximation of the fault in the model may, may be perfectly acceptable. So we've implemented this software, which we call Fault Maker, as a plugin in Petrel, as well as a standalone application. And this, this lets us really target specific faults in geo models. So this fault here, for example, We've taken it, you know, it's extracted from the Petrel model. We've, we've made a sub-seismic realization of it. And, you know, this particular realization is 11 different elements placed on the fault. So two of the elements are shown on the right there, colored for, for reservoir permeability. And what we're doing at the bottom of the slide there is assessing the connectivity of the permeability field within these elements at different permeability thresholds. This gives us some important insights about the role of a cross-fault and up-fault flow within the fault zone. So these flow paths can ultimately be included in the original flow model for a process that, that we call geometrical upscaling. Unfortunately, the structure of grids that are often used for geological models imposes limits on the types of elements, fault zone elements that we can model. So this fault maker model here, for example, looks quite complex. It's got many relays and lenses on it, but it only actually contains one of the three types of element that we know that exists on faults. And the other two types of elements, we just can't model with, with properly with standard grid formats. So we've been experimenting with various types of more flexible grid structures. And we found a format that allows us to model the full range of fault zone elements that we think are important. And here's a simple example of that. You know, we're looking at a fault with a very common type of structure on it. And we've built this with a new grid format I'm talking about. And, you know, modeling this, this, these simple breaching faults wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible in a conventional pillar grid format. So just to summarize, then I've shown you where we are with these two research areas, you know, the compression algorithm and discrete fault zone element modeling. So at the moment, we have an ongoing demonstration project of the compression algorithm. This is focused on the deep marine deposits of the Ross Formation, which is a classic reservoir analog for many oil reservoirs worldwide. But depositional, deep water depositional systems are also sites being considered for CO2 sequestration in the North Sea, for example. So there are possible application areas of the modeling in, in, in that area, too. I've also shown how we can use the model as an alternative to discrete fracture network modeling for high connectivity, low volume fraction vein systems. And, you know, I think this is pretty relevant for seal bypass, understanding seal bypass systems, and more generally for risking seals for underground fluid storage. The second thing we'd like to do is set up a project to develop fault zone element modeling using the flexible grid. So based on the, the huge amount of data we have in the fault analysis group about fault zone structure, the experience we have on, on, on modeling fault zones, I think we can build a really useful code that could have applications in many subsurface sectors where, where flow within or across fault zones is important. Finally, we want to find one or more industry partners to take our methods and, and commercialize them. You know, both fault maker and the compression algorithm have attracted interest from software vendors, but we need to make a really concerted push to, to take them to the next level. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I see there's a bit of chat. I see Chip Corbett, a keen modeler, is, is asking a few questions. So I think get onto the chat there and, and have a conversation with him. It's fascinating. Um, so the next presentation is by Pat Burton. I'm going to share the slides and um, it's around um, social engagement, really, uh, with uh, the Earth resources. So a big topic that we've all been talking about earlier on. <clears throat> so you let me know. If you can see everything okay? Yeah. Okie doke. 
Thanks, Eamon. Um, and now for something completely different, I would have to say. I mean, from hearing our colleagues, very, very, very good scientific sort of thing, we're looking at now the social science and humanities and what their response are. So I come from DCU and I'm in communication. So I'm interested in the broad aspect of communicating climate change and environmental issues. Next slide, please. So very much linking with how social science and humanities and the sciences need to all connect together. There's been a lot of research and, and evidence now that we need to all work together in addressing these issues. So ICRAG2 is very committed to that idea. And we're sort of very involved in looking at the energy transition from a very broad perspective and engaging uh, across disciplinary boundaries. Next slide, please. So we're uh, sort of based out in, in DCU. Uh, and again, Porig is talking a bit about that later. But you know, there's a few of us that are interested in all aspects of science and science communication and environmental communication. So again, you can talk to us in detail. If anyone has a chat, talk to me later. Next slide, please. So our background is in media. And, and I'm particularly interested in eco-criticism, how the media represents, how film, literature, all that sort of connects with science and science risk and communication and responsible innovation, all that sort of broad areas, what I've been doing for the last 20 years, I would say in, in my area of film and, and eco-criticism. Next slide, please. And what I'm particularly interested in is looking at new imaginaries. Uh, geoscience and science communication is always looking for new ways of representing things. I'm particularly exercised by climate change and how we need new ways of representing these issues and how science can help in coming up with new ways as well. So we need to work together. The arts and the sciences need to always cross connect in lots of ways to, to make new ways of telling stories. And that's something that as a storyteller, I think scientists have to be storytellers and I would see myself as a storyteller. Next slide, please. Two good, very good documentaries recently, 20, uh, 2040 and Earth are really good documentaries for sort of teasing out areas of geoscience and what ICRAG is doing and sort of finding solutions and showing solutions and, and ways of representing solutions are really important for the general public. I mean, scientists speaking for themselves is fine, but we need to connect with, with mass audiences. And that's where I see um, our role is in the social science of how to sort of connect with this in other ways. Next slide, please. So representing the imaginaries and, and obviously scientific responses are, are really, Emer was mentioning about the, the our sort of issues that we've had with our uh, climate change bills, all the sort of the issues we're having to try and to reduce our carbon footprint, COP26, how we sort of, how ICRAG and how researchers address this. I think social science have a major role to play on this. And I would be one that would very much buy into, unlike some of my colleagues, that we need extractive industries. So we need ways of, of legitimizing, but also harmonizing the debate. So as people aren't just fighting against each other around climate change, we need to see ways of, of engaging that we're all working to solve problems. And that's, that's my bottom line. And that's what we would see as our bottom line. Next slide, please. Also, there is a danger, obviously, of brainwashing. So we, we need to be careful of this. That uh, I mean, I work with industries and companies and and ICRAG and lots of different sorts of people. But we we need to be and, and um, stakeholders are very want to know what is what's going on here, what's going on, and in environmental issues, we fight among ourselves as well between the relos and the fundies. What's the best solution? Uh, we we can all be abstract about solutions, but we need to find technical solutions as well as other sorts of solutions. It's a social problem as well as a scientific problem. So marrying all these together and trying to get reverse gear engineering going and addressing this climate emergency is something that all our scientists need to be involved in and we will help as much as we can. So I'm now passing you over to Porig Murphy and it's gonna be an online, He's, uh, he fortunately couldn't be here, but this is a sort of a project that we're working on at the moment that, that we want to sort of get involved in. So just if you, Emer, if you can turn up the slide, the sound. Good afternoon, I'm Patrick Murphy from the School of Communications at Dublin City University. Uh, my area of expertise is in science communication. Sorry. Uh, typical technology, sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Patrick Murphy from the School of Communications at Dublin City University. Uh, my area of expertise is in science communication, public engagement of science and technology, and also responsible research and innovation. 
And Pat talked you through some of the uh, risk discourses, the kind of popular culture aspect of how we understand the future that comes through um, uh, Hollywood, it comes through the various documentaries that are in place, and you, got, you, you went through a couple of them. Um, we are also working, myself, Pat, and uh, Dr. Freaker of Brolicon, also in the School of Communications, uh, we're also looking at uh, various ways that social sciences are looking at geoscientific uh, topics. For example, socio-technical systems, the way that uh, various scientific um, um, and social processes are changing for adaptation procedures and how exactly the, the technologies are, are adapting for that. And the various power and identity relations that are involved with that. Also, of course, the policy, what is the SDGs, the various types of protocols that are now going to be in place because of the COP meetings and the various agreements, international agreements, and very importantly, the expertise and the publics and how the expertise and publics work together. It's an important dimension. There cannot be an assumption that we have uninformed publics here. There's various types of expertise here. And myself and my colleagues have identified a gap in the literature because actually there's whole areas of social sciences and humanities that can actually look at even deeper level at how we see um, renewables, areas like coal, mining, all the kind of areas that actually we're moving away from but are still an integral part of how it can work. Um, and various uh, uh, disciplines like object-oriented ontology, and new materialism, the overlap there. And crucially, we want to make sure there's a media part of this. That's where the films that Pat uh, uh, is talking about represent the very real earth, the very stuff of the earth, if you like, the smell of the coal, the smell of the oil, the very aspect of what you see uh, that guides us along. That they are all integral to the kind of subjective aspect that we need to look at when we're talking about uh, imagining the future together, and we've included them in a recent paper. So this is where iPad comes in, because we feel there is a, a, a potential here to go further with this and see how exactly we can bring some of these risk discourses that we've seen in the literature in to discussions in IPRAG. So you, we can take any geoscientific example from IPRAG, but if we focus, say, on, on uh, carbon capture or hy hybrid thermal uh, technologies, we could actually have our teams from your groups here, or our colleagues here today, uh, talking to citizen panels. But before we do that, we work out a, a responsible research and innovation protocol. This is essentially looking to see how we could actually ask citizens to, to consider gender aspects of what we do, the ethical aspects, the public engagement side itself, the uh, literacy and science education aspect of this, the open access, how our data is actually out there in the open world and how people can see that, and then how that finally is governed within the systems that we have. So that's the RRI uh, setup. So the, the real way of looking at RRI is, is focusing on public engagement and bringing publics in. The risk discourses that Pat talked about, the, the, the kind of dystopias, are uh, sometimes they're dystopias, sometimes they're utopian, right? We can use all of these in a way that is very positive to how we talk about imagined futures together in the code design. And so if we actually bring citizens, these citizens power, we're talking about up to three of them perhaps, or maybe various stages of, of the different uh, cycle of iCrack. But if we first of all discuss the, the kind of the, what are, what's out there in Hollywood, as it were, the kind of the popular culture dimension of that, then we have a set of informed uh, discussions. And this is where we ask our scientists here to talk to them directly to the citizen panels, and then some kind of co-design protocol where we have agreements and what can actually be uh, worked on together. This then asks that ICRA becomes an observatory, not just for what has been said in a kind of wider domain about thinking and imagining the future, but what can actually be done practically and locally here and now. And that impact part is huge. What we are saying about the impact here is that we're actually asking our, our colleagues here to present, present in the first instance, but also to make some kind of commitment. And that could be a modest commitment in the sense of change. What change in the protocol? Could it be the protocol for dissemination? Could it go further and be a step in the scientific uh, operating procedures themselves and how they could be done differently? Could it be something on the policy aspect of this or how it is actually interacted on the policy realm? And these are all discussions and agreements we can talk between our scientists and uh, the citizen panels. As far as outcomes and impact, 
the RRI protocols that we're talking about here then wouldn't just be for the geoscientific topics that we have in ICRAG. They can actually be for any emerging technologies. And this is in line with so many other RRI projects that are in, in, in train across the, the European research area at the moment. It ensures a socially robust system in the sense that it is actually interacting with society. And the outputs then, very specifically, we can be talking about these open access and engagement protocols and how we actually can set up multiple stakeholder uh, workshops and co-design workshops, uh, but also, of course, the high impact publications, very interdisciplinary in nature, policy briefs then showing exactly how SFI and the department can actually work together on these again. And of course, the education and public engagement aspect of this is hugely important. And on that EPE, from the King do this excellent thing and do this for ICRAG. We are bringing all this EP directly into the heart now of the sciences of ICRAG. Can it be possible, and I believe it can, that we actually have some impact internally in ICRAG on what the public say to us about how things can be done? It can be modest, it can be great, but actually this would be the first of its kind, how we can actually co-create and design the future together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think we've come to the end, really, of our session, unfortunately, a very short period of time. But if you want to know more about what we're doing in the energy transition space or any of the other areas, there's a few names here, myself and Aoife Brady and Francesca Martini. Um, you can contact us, catch us on LinkedIn or catch us here, personal message, message us here. Um, I was just going to say,